Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Remote STEM Class. Mr. Dowd here. Hope everyone's having a fantastic day. I know I am because it's Thursday, or as I like to say, Friday Eve. So guys, just remember we have today and we have tomorrow and then we're off next week. So let's get going. So last class, I do believe I did the Grand Teton National Park. I'm on to the Great Smoky Mountain. The Great Smoky Mountain. So this um, area is in North Carolina slash Tennessee, so it must be on the border somewhere. So our first location, ooh, why is this horrendous rendering? Hmm, how's the Wi-Fi? It's looking okay. Hmm, very odd. Anyways, guys, so the first place is Laurel Falls. So this is a named after the mountain, mountain laurel plant that grows here. This trek passes a storied waterfall. So hence the name Laurel Falls. So Laurel is a type of plant. I'm really not sure what it looks like. It must be something like that. I don't know. We got this nice waterfall going down. Looks very nice. Why is the rendering so bad? My Wi-Fi must not be so good. A couple people looking at the rocks. More people up there. Very cool. Next we have Noah the Bud Ogle Cabin. So the remains of a late 19th century homestead featuring a hewn log cabin. I don't know what hewn means. Maybe, I'm not really sure. Four pen barnyard and a tub mill. So here is the house itself. Would you guys want to live here? Uh, personally, I would not. I don't even think, does that actually have real glass? I don't even know if that's real glass in there. Yeah. So I assume that's maybe the mill or the barn. It looks like more like a barn, but maybe a mill's around. Don't see the mill around. But cool. So this is the way life was back in the late 19th century. So that's like the 18, late 1800s or so. Next, go to the chimney tops. Hey, maybe you guys, some of you guys will uh, grow up to be a chimney sweep. Who knows? <laughs> so the chimney spots, uh, tops. It's a popular two-mile trail in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, reaching an elevation of 1,400 feet with spectacular views. Um, I'm not really sure how you get up that. I guess you have to kind of wall climb up to get up there. But if they can do it, I'm sure most of us can do it too. But those views are spectacular, as you can see. But 1,400 feet is uh, it's not an easy hike by any means. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. On to halfway through our list is the Newfound Gap. So it's an alpine road. So alpine just means it's up in the hills, in the mountains, uh, featuring the Rockefeller Memorial honoring the Great Smoky Mountains Park financer. So the guy who went ahead and bought the land so it could be given over to the National Park Association. So this name, this that is Rockefeller. Yeah, so it's a place you can drive up and you can have some nice views of the, uh, the mountains. Next we have Klingman's Dome. Sounds kind of scary, but it's a mountain with a seasonal road, so the, it's probably unpassable in the uh, summertime. Why is the rendering so bad? Annoying. But yeah, so uh, it's by seasonal road, I think it's probably for the winter time or so. Uh, it's just not safe enough to come up, even if they did pave the road or not pave, but um, clear the roads out of snow. So it's a paved trail and a observation tower plus an information center and store. So there's a store up here and an information center, our favorite. But that is a 360 degree view. Oh, more people not rendering. But uh, yeah, it's a very nice view there. Push for that sunset. It's awesome. And you're above the clouds, which is really cool to see. Next on this list is the Sugarlands Visitor Center, Ranger Staff's facility offering park maps, a wildlife museum, and a bookstore. So now you guys all love your books. Next up is the Mingus Mill. It's an 1886 grist mill. So grist, if I am not mistaken, is kind of like an oats. It's, it's grounded up. Um, it offers a demonstration of still functional slowies, turbine, and other machinery. I don't know what that is. Not entirely sure, but it's an old mill that still works back from 1886, which is a uh, very old, old mill. Pretty cool. And on to our last location, we have the Mountain Farm Museum. 
So it's a group of historical log farm buildings moved here in the 1950s. So I wonder if they were built and then moved over afterwards with living history exhibits. Hmm. So it's an old, like if you ever go down to um, Plymouth area where they have Plymouth Rock, I feel like it's probably a very similar area. But yeah, some cool stuff. But that's all we got for today. So hope you guys enjoyed the Great Smoky Mountains because I think it's named the Great Smoky Mountains because you can see the clouds there. That was pretty cool. All right, guys, have a great Thursday. One more day to go, and we're on vacation. See ya. Good morning. Today I'm going to make some waffles. But instead of making the recipe for 12 waffles, I'm going to make it for half of that. I'm going to use this Bisquick mix, which you can also use pancakes. I've made them out of this before and you can also use it for regular biscuits. So there's a lot of little tricks you can do with it. So I'm going to cut it. It says I need two cups of this. I'm going to use one cup. And then I'm going to use a cup of milk. I need one egg. Tiny bit of corn oil. Okay. This makes a lot. I think it makes a lot better. Depends how many you have in your family. But these waffles are also going to be tiny. See? this because it's a little watery. Just to thicken up. You can also use, they have waffle and pancake mix in the store that's already made in a bottle. You can also use that. I think you only have to add water to it. too much milk, but that's okay. Just thicken it up. Now when you, uh, when I make, if I make waffles at home and I don't make them for everybody because everybody doesn't want them or they're not around, then I just keep the extra batter in the fridge and you can use them for a different day. So this is going to turn on when I plug it in. I've already sprayed it. It's very hot, so you need to be careful. Hopefully this is thick enough. If not, I'll have to add more, but we'll see. So, I'm just gonna put some of it in this waffle maker. I'm gonna use a small scoop or a small cup. Okay. It's 
gonna fill in all the nooks and crannies. There you go. You don't wanna overflow it because when you push it down on it, it's gonna come out the sides, which isn't a big deal, but then you'd be wasting batter. Okay, so it feels hot. I'm gonna just go gently. Let it cook. Now remember, when you're making waffles or pancakes, you don't need to douse it with syrup. You can use fruit. You can use a little bit of confectionery sugar. All right, you don't need to load it with syrup. This is syrup has a lot of sugar. Okay, so this shouldn't take too, too long. Ooh, there you go. So you just need to get, make sure it gets a little more brown. Almost done. So if you're making this for a bunch of people, you're obviously gonna want a bigger waffle maker. I just use this little one because there's only a couple of us. There we go, it's getting nice and brown now. You have to be careful because it's on a hot it's hot surface, so make sure that you don't burn your fingers. Let's see, we should be almost done. Sometimes I'm impatient, I keep lifting it up. <laughs> Now, if you're gonna make another one, I would spray it again. Remember, it's already hot, so it's probably gonna cook a little bit faster. bit more to get those little crevices in. There you go. And then close it gently and it's going to cook. Now remember it's a little warmer than last time so it's probably going to cook a little bit faster. So that's pretty much it. I'm gonna make two waffles and then you can put butter and syrup on them or fruit or just eat them plain. Yeah, I think they taste pretty good plain. So just something to think about. You 
hear the news on in the background. <laughs> All right, so let's see if I can get me some syrup. Oh, I have syrup, but I need the step ladder, so I'll have to wait till it's done. These would be good too for a little snack, or like I said, who doesn't love breakfast for dinner? All right, and there's nights you're not sure what to have, and you're like, you know what, I could really go for. A breakfast food. Let's have French toast, or let's have waffles, or let's have pancakes. There we go. So I'm going to unplug it. I don't want to electrocute myself. and I could make a whole bunch more and that's only half the batter so okay guys I'll talk to you next hey gators so I know you've been working hard on this project all right we are now on scene four, the final scene you should have already been working on this all right but we are gonna go down and scene four is going to take place at seven o'clock in the morning little joe mar's bedroom all right uh little joe mar's sitting at the edge of the bed and we need to come to a natural conclusion all right so in scene three we had a conflict come to its final conclusion between boogeyman and sandman and now we're going to finish off the play all right so the resolution for the play can be positive it doesn't have to come to a happy ending all right, you can be creative. You can do it however you want. What I want you to do is finish it, and I want you to go back, reread the whole thing, make any changes you need, and then turn it in in Google Classroom. Can't wait to read them, Gators. Great job. They are due today, by the way. Hey, guys. So for our next project, we're going to be transforming one object into another object. And an artist who was really good at that is named M.C. Escher. This is an example of M.C. Escher's artwork. So if you look closely, you may have noticed he started drawing fish at the bottom, but the fish gradually transformed their shape. And then you kind of stop seeing the fish, but you notice these birds a little bit more. So he created this image where it looks like the fish is transforming into a bird. What's happening is the negative space is changing. So if you look at the negative space next to the fish down here, the black areas, they're going from this kind of ambiguous shape where we don't really know what it looks like, and it's slowly turning into this bird shape. And then as you go up to the top part of the page, these birds have the most details but the shapes at the bottom have less detail. The fish, if you look at the white shapes of the fish, they're gradually changing. So if you look at this diagonal row here, you can see this image of the fish. It looks just like a fish with all the details. The next one has a little bit less detail on the body. This one hardly has any detailed lines. This is starting to look like a shape that we don't even know what it is. Just kind of like a, a very simple shape an abstract shape that doesn't really make sense. And then this one, it's just completely lost. There's no fish anymore. So you can see he went from one, two, three, four, five, from one to this fifth one, where it gradually changes from an identifiable, somewhat realistic looking fish to this abstract kind of blob shape in the negative space around the birds. So he was really good at making these transformations with his artwork and these optical illusions. It's really cool. So we're going to take a look at some examples of some artwork where the artist started with one object, carrot in this one, and it slowly transforms and changes and morphs into something else, carrot to seahorse. 
So you can see this very detailed carrot, looks like somewhat realistic carrot, and then it's starting to change a little bit. The artists changed the top, those leaves look a little strange, they're, they're a little different, they're moving, and then this is starting to curve up a little bit. This one is where I start to really see a seahorse. So there was a big transformation from this second one to the third one. Here it really looks like a seahorse, and there is the final one with the most details to make it look like a seahorse. Look at this one. Hey, we just did that last week. Remember we were drawing hands and we did the peace sign? <laughs> so look, the artist made the hand. It looks just like a realistic looking hand. But here you notice, oh, wait a minute, something's changing. Something's transforming and morphing here. You can see that little face. This one really looks like a rabbit, but there's still a lot of the original form of the hand here. And then this one has the most detail and it looks the most like a realistic drawing of a rabbit, but you can see the transformation. So he, this artist did it in four steps. One, two, three, four. Here's a neat one. That yin and yang symbol gradually changes to two fish. Pretty neat. Oops. And here's a few different examples of some artists' work. A car slowly changing into a turtle. Can you guys see that? So there's the car slowly changing into a turtle. Hot dog slowly changing into one of those little mini Dachshund dogs, the little hot dog dogger. And then here is a boat and it's gradually changing into a swordfish. I like that one. And then there, some goggles or, or glasses slowly changing to cherries. So it's pretty fun. This project is great. So I'm gonna have you guys think about what two objects will you use for your project. Here's one pretty cool. Look at this. Fish changing into a sneaker. What? Look at that. So I want you guys to choose two objects. It could be a fish and a sneaker if you want, or some other two objects. And then I'm going to ask you guys to make a sketch of one of the drawings, and then make a sketch of that other the other object that you chose. So let's say you chose a candlestick and a lobster. I'm gonna show you how to set up your paper. You're gonna draw one, so if it was a candlestick, you would draw that on the far left. And then you're gonna leave some spaces for your tra transformation. And then the last square on the right will be the lobster, if that's what you're choosing to do. But you guys can be creative. You don't have to make a copy of one of the examples that I'm showing. You can if you want, but I'd like to see some ideas that I haven't seen yet. You know, be really creative. So this one's pretty neat. So it goes from acorn. So the two objects that this artist was using is acorn and a bee. And then the artist had to kind of solve this, this problem here. Like, how do I make this acorn gradually transform and change into the bee? So you can see how he handled that. And it looks pretty cool. I think. Here's a sneaker slowly morphing and changing into a wolf. Here's an old boot. You can see that old boot here. Very detailed boot. Here it starts to change its shape a little bit. This one starts to really kind of really kind of pull away from that boot shape and something different's happening at the top. That really starts to look like a bear down there. This, of course, looks like a bear. And then that's the final last image of the bear. So from boot to bear. Here's a cute one, a clock changing, slowly, gradually morphing into an owl. So I'd like you guys to come up with two objects. One of the objects, the first object that you draw on your far left, is going to transform into your second object that will be at your far right. You can do it in four steps or five steps. It's up to you. Sneaker morphing into some kind of a cheetah. Oh, a big cat. It's pretty neat. And this one, a lamp turning into a, some kind of cobra snake. And that was the last one I had to show you. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is you're going to need a piece of paper and a pencil and a ruler if you have it. If you don't have a ruler, it's fine. But you want to kind of plan out 
how many steps will you have? Will you have four or five steps to get from your first object to your second object? So you can make some squares. If you want to draw bigger, you can. Just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to keep it about this size. But you want to make some squares. Think about what's going to be in your first one. I'm just going to put four on here, but you can actually do five if you wish. Okay, so I want to see some kind of object in the first one. Then you can do your last object here. And then you need to think about how is it going to gradually transform. All right, guys, good luck. Thanks for watching Enrichment TV, Gators. Remember, work hard, be nice, and we'll see you tomorrow.